What's up, everyone? Lennon Lee por aquí. Bienvenidos a otro episodio de Se Habla Real Estate, el show donde aprendemos cómo hacer dinero invirtiendo en Estados Unidos en real estate y cómo pues, utilizar ese vehículo de real estate para alcanzar la, la libertad financiera. Por aquí me encuentro con mi socio, mi brother, Arturo Borges. ¿Qué pasó, mi pana? ¿Cómo está todo? Todo excelente, Lee, todo excelente. Eh, gracias a Dios, muy emocionado por la entrevista de hoy. Sé que tú también lo estás. Hoy traímos a, o traemos ¿no? a, un, a, un, a un invitado de mucho calibre y que, hopefully, esta conversación va a ser en inglés, by the way, y hopefully, pues, eh, le encuentre muchísimo valor porque estamos seguros de que se los traeremos. Se trata de Reed Goosens, de Wildhorn Capital, Reed es un emprendedor en bienes raíces y socio de Wildhorn Capital, la cual es una firma de inversión en bienes raíces multifamiliar con un portafolio valorado en alrededor de 220 millones de dólares. Originario de Australia, Reed se mudó a los Estados Unidos para continuar su carrera de inversión a principios del 2012. También es el anfitrión del podcast de inversión en bienes raíces Investing in the U.S., an Aussie's Guide to U.S. Real Estate, en el que entrevista a otros distinguidos empresarios de bienes raíces sobre su éxito y ayuda a guiar a otros inversores internacionales que desean exitosamente irrumpir en los Estados Unidos. Reed, it's my pleasure to have you on the show. How are you? Hello, guys. Thanks for thanks for having me on a Spanish-speaking show. My uh, my Spanish is non-existent. <laughs> Thank you. We got you. We got you, man. We got you. We still wanted to have you. Uh, well, just so everyone knows, uh, Reed and I are we've been friends for well, like. Uh, um, Three years now or so. Three or four we, years, yeah. Yeah, we're partners on a couple deals, uh, more like four to five hundred units uh, worth of, of multifamily units. Um, so, yeah, man. I mean, I'm excited to have you. Uh, it's the first time we're doing a podcast together, so um, I was looking forward to it. Awesome. And um, yeah, I know that you're gonna be able to bring some some real value to our audience. So um, why don't why don't we get started just to Uh, just tell us, um, you know, the two to three minute story um, of who you are, how you how you got here. Yeah, well, who, who I am—that's a that's a deep question to start with, mate. But yeah, <laughs> but yeah I'm trying to keep it two to three minutes. Yeah, so the the whole shtick that I have is that. Um, My stories are built around moving to the United States. Uh, I moved to here in 2012 to chase uh, two loves. One was the my then girlfriend, now wife, Erica. She she's American, but also the love of New York City. I do not live no longer live in New York City, but I lived there for a couple of years before relocating back to uh, Erica's hometown of Los Angeles, where we currently reside. Um, yeah, and when I first moved here, I came here as a structural engineer, as a um, just to really live as an expat. My my whole dream and goal and Uh, I had an itch was to live in New York City just for a period of time. And uh, my coming to America story is really about the whole thing of um, fearing regret and and not wanting to wake up when I'm 60 or 70 years of age and going, gosh, I wish I'd given that a go. Um, because yeah. the, the, the biggest thing for me was, well, if I if I go to the United States and I fail, well, I just go back to Australia and I get another engineering job and I've you know, got my family back there. And that, that, that's the worst thing that can happen. Um, right. so, so I moved here in 2012. Um, I, I'd already picked up the book. Written. How old were you? Sorry. I was well, were you? 26 years of age um, okay. back in 2012. Yeah. So I'm now do the math. I'm 34. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah. So back then, uh, I'd already picked up the book Rich Dad, Poor Dad after traveling around the world for a couple of years in late 2009, early 2010. I'd moved back to Australia after gallivanting around the south of France and living in London for a period of time. And I just really thought to myself, I cannot sit in a cubicle for the next 40 years of my life. I need someone to pay me to live my to live my life, right? And so the whole thing, I didn't even know what an entrepreneur was, but I stumbled across the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and that's really got the, the, the fire burning within me. And I started learning about real estate investing because I was somehow, I was rubbing shoulders with developers in my day job as, a, as an engineer. And I started out educating myself and Uh, in the first you know, year, year and a half. And then come end of 2011, I was still in Australia and I had a decision to make. And that was, okay, do I want to you know, keep working or running the rat race or do you want to go live in you know, New York City for a period of time? And, and that's what I decided to do. And I quit my job and moved halfway across the world. And, um, and as I said, the rest is history, which is not necessarily true yeah. because there's a whole lot that got on in between. But uh, yeah, that was the coming to America story. 
I love it, man. I love I love it because it's uh, it's you know a, a lot of us identify just with just that, right? Like I'm, I have a similar story. Uh, I, I yeah, I graduated was an engineer. I moved here. I had no idea about you know that I was going to get in real estate, but I knew that um, that I wanted to be here. And you know now that not when I got here, then okay, it was a process of figuring out uh, a lot of stuff what what I wanted to do and how I wanted to do it and uh and same thing rich that poor that read that book and it it, it just it changed everything for me mm-hmm. so yeah that's awesome how, how that transition into you as real I mean how, how did you transition you, you said you know you came from Australia you get, went to the to New York but how did you actually transition into you as real estate and you know passive investing entrepreneurship and specifically multifamily real estate. How did that come about? Yeah, so the big thing that I personally believe is that I have a bit of a, in my opinion, I have a bit of a superpower. And and most people who come from outside of the United States have a bit of a superpower of not realizing, Some a lot of Americans don't realize what they're sitting on, right? And so when I first moved to the United States, the biggest thing that I realized and was shocked about is, you know, moving to the Big Apple um, was, you know, I was attending small meetup events in Australia back in 2010, 2011. But coming to the United States was just like, it was networking on steroids. You know, like I had, you know, the whole REAs, you know, the Real Estate Investment Associations, these whole nationally organized groups of people that came together to talk about real estate. And it was readily available for like 20 or 30 bucks at the door. Like I was at my first REAR event within two weeks of moving to New York City. Um, And so it was just this whole idea of access to information was a lot easier than it was in Australia, or at least my perception of it was um, better organized, well run. Obviously, being in New York City, the Big Apple, it was a lot of fast talking Americans. So I had to, you know, really tune my mind into and, and my my investing lingo into understanding what the hell they're talking about, right? And and so that was a, a really awesome step to realize that stuff that I would pay thousands and thousands of dollars to a guru back in Australia was readily available at a weekend seminar or was. You know, available in a bus tour that I went on. I went on a couple of bus tours early on in my days when I back in 2012. But the biggest thing I realized was, oh my gosh, you can buy these cheap properties for less than fifty thousand bucks, and they can cash flow. Yeah. And you would never ever find that in Australia. And and so, you know, I come from a country that think of um, the investments, uh, you know, circle or you know, ecosystem in Australia with real estate like. New York or LA or San Francisco. So high appreciation markets, so high demand, low supply. Um, I also come from a country where we only have 25 million people, but we inhabit a land that is as big as mainland America. So we can only really inhabit 20% of our actual physical land, excuse me, because the rest of it is, is, is arid. It's a desert. So when you are confined to the coastal markets in Australia, plus cu- coupled with the low population, you're, everyone wants to live around the major cities and there's only a certain amount of land that can be inhabitable. And so that drives up the, the value and there's a lot of demand to live in those, those sort of five, five major cities. So when it came to the United States, it was just sort of like you can inhabit north to south, east to west, and there's these secondary and tertiary markets because – just purely from the fact of the population is so massive. It was like, we're not even one-tenth of the population of America. I think it's like 300 million. Yeah. So they, they just sport all these other different MSAs and, and those MSAs were affordable. And and I could drive to one of them, which was within four hours of New York City, which was Syracuse, New York. And I remember getting on a Greyhound bus every Saturday. I'd do my, my engineering job uh, throughout the week and um, jump on a bus and, and go to a market which I could afford. And within, I think, six was months. This all, was this all on, on your own? Or all on my own. All on my own. All on my own. It was just be, the, See, the, 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 I, the other story I, don't, I hadn't laid in here was um, when I first moved to New York, I didn't have a job. I had, and, and there's an awesome visa that, that exists between Australia and, and America called the um, E3 visa for, for Australians. And you can, you can have an E3 visa, as many of them as you want, as long as you've got a job. And so what I... Uh, what I did was I donned on a suit and literally was knocking on doors and and, and I, I wrote out uh, on an A4 piece of paper all the engineering joints in in New York City that what I thought would have less than 50 people, employees, because with, with less than 50 people, you wouldn't have HR. And HR would just look at my resume and go, oh, he's not from Australia, he's not from America, screw it, he's in the right. bin. So I had to sort of take my step t- take myself to the next level and, and not just put my resume out on indeed.com but take it and take it a step further and I started knocking on doors and the whole reason that I could stay in America was to get that visa 
Um, so I spent a lot of time early on, when I say a lot of time, it was only six weeks and I got a job offer, but that hunger yeah. to go and knock on doors and make it happen. So you ask the question of like, did you go up to Syracuse by myself? Of course I did. I moved up across the world. I'm going to get on a bus to go to Syracuse and, and figure out a few <laughs> things, you know, like it's just the nature yeah. of who I am, of the, the curiosity that I had. Um, just be like, okay, well, I waste a bit of time, you know, four hours up, four hours back. And uh, I was usually back in New York City by by eight o'clock at night and was able to go out for a few uh, drinks with some friends. Um, but I'd gone up to Syracuse, saw, you know, half a dozen properties, underwrote them all and, okay, you know, build, build a period of time uh, over six months, you know, building relationships with brokers and banks and all that sort of stuff. And within six months, had bought my first property. So, so yeah. A residential residential property was it? It was a triplex for thirty eight thousand okay. bucks, and here's the here's the uh, kicker, right? Like, and, and this is to all those people who are listening to this. It clearly, they're listening to it in my lovely Spanish accent. Um, is the uh, is the fact that like I got to the point in New York, and I vividly remember this: riding the subway to work, no stock in a book, and I just thought to myself. And at that point, right, guys, I, I'd been self educating. For it was you know early two thousand mid mid two thousand and twelve. I'd been self educating for about two and a half years now because I you know picked up right. book Rich Dad Porter back in two thousand and nine. So it, it got to the point where it was analysis paralysis, and I knew that if I if I didn't you know I wasn't going to get to deal number ten without doing deal number one. And I use the analogy of like you don't get fit reading about a fitness book, right? You read from a fitness book. You actually got to step into the gym and get on the treadmill. And that was my whole drive. I just got to the point where I was like, I'm sick of reading about it. I've got to go freaking put my money where my mouth is. I'd saved up a bit of cash and I went and bought this property for $38,000 all cash because I had no credit and no one would lend to me. And I just made, I made it happen. Um, but I had a very, very good lesson in Section 8 um, housing and this sort of bright-eyed, bushy-tailed Australian coming to the United States figuring out what a ghetto was. So um, yeah. all the things that, that, that you know, I, I didn't know about. Also, you know, it, it, I, I, my, my first property I had had a drive-by shooting at it, but that's not an issue. It would just, you know, it is, wow. it is one of those things that you learn and you, you move on from. But the, the, the understanding is or the message is that, like, you don't get anywhere without giving it a go first. Now, you've got to be educated, which I was, but I also had to go out and take action. And that's the biggest thing that I hopefully that, you know, today's conversation we can talk about is, 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 yeah. is taking that action because it, nothing will ever happen. You'll just sit there idle and sitting on the fence. So, yeah. So yeah. yeah. No, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's great. That's amazing. And uh, there's something that we always talk about here in the podcast, which is, um, you know, you need to have the education. So, so you gain that knowledge because knowledge gives you confidence and only when you feel confident is that not only, but typically when, when you feel confident is when you, when you're able to take action before then you're, you're, you're just afraid, right. you know, cause you probably don't, don't think you know enough. Um, and, and, and yeah, I mean, ultimately it's, uh, it's that, but it's also, um, you know, the reason why we do this podcast and the reason why you do your podcast, which is to also inspire people uh, that have a similar story to you and to us uh, to say, well, that's, and that's why I asked you, do, do you go up there uh, to Syracuse on your own? Because a lot of people, they're just, they're, they're just not built like that, mm -hmm. right? Like they just, okay, well, if, if I can't find a friend that goes with me or a friend that's interested in real estate, then you know what, I might not do it even though i read all these books and i understand how it works and i know it makes sense but i don't want to do it on my own i'm kind of scared so this uh your story our stories uh, uh inspire people to hopefully well it's, it's the expat way right like i'm not uh i, I can class yeah. myself as an expat because I'm, I'm not an american citizen i have a green card because i finally married an american girl but yeah. the, the, the yeah. thing is it's that sort of no matter any walk of life i see so many expats that have come to this country or any country even in australia and they they've got nothing else right the, the back's against the wall now for, for luckily for me i didn't have that sob story of my back right. you know i just my failure was i'd move back to australia that was it and I got comfortable with that failure. There's a lot of other people who have got a lot worse than I do coming to this country and making, you know, shifting mountains to to get to success. And and it's yeah. that type of expat expat adage, you know, backs against the wall. You're going to make it happen. You're yeah. here. Your boots on the ground. Let's freaking give it a go. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. Uh, super powerful. And actually, Damon John uh, talks about that in the, the Power of Broke. I don't know if you guys have read it. Um, you know, how that can actually be a blessing. In this case, not really, you know, being broke, but being an immigrant, 
Uh, you know, even though we come from very different countries with, with very different economic and political systems, being Australia and Venezuela, I'm talking about, um, you know, we as an immigrant tend to, you know, come in with different advantages. And I want to ask you, I mean, what, what, what do you see are those, you know, some of those advantages or that competitive edge you have being an immigrant versus what you just talked about that Americans oftentimes they don't really realize what they have here and take it for granted. Yeah, well, I think, look, the, the the big thing that I've, like when I was, part of our DNA in Australia is that we're, we want it, we're so far out of the way and, and we're, we're one island and it's a big island and we only have 24 million people. Like it's part of our DNA to go and explore the world. Um, and I think travel and if you can do it, uh, even if it's within your own country, but just going experiencing other people's way of thinking, other people's lifestyles, other people's cultures, is really powerful to help you then realize what you have. Uh, and I'm very blessed to be have come from a country um, that is not in war, that doesn't have political un- unrest uh, or civil unrest. Um, so I'm very fortunate to like that. But I'm also I also realize the power of of going traveling and, and open taking off the blinkers and going experiencing the world because the world has so much to offer. Um, and if you can and, and you can go do that and being an expat, i.e., going and because you know, that's what an expat is, you, you're essentially traveling to another country. Um, you you have that sense of this is new and this is uh, an adventure. And when you have that sense of adventure, hopefully that inspires you to do more and be more and not take what you've worked so hard to get to that country um, for granted, right? Which is what some sometimes some Americans can take for granted. And so back to that sort of superpower i think a lot of expats have that superpower of well it's taken me so much just to get here it's cost me thousands of dollars in flight plane tickets quit my job pack my life up in a bag and hopefully this works you know with only the hope that it works that was it there was no guarantees um and so getting comfortable with backing yourself is really important and that's probably in hindsight 2020 looking back at when i was 26 years of age it was just i was willing to take a bet on myself and that is all it was. Uh, and so a lot of other expats do. You know, I was just speaking to someone else on the uh, on, a, on a broker's call and she happens to be uh, Australian but has lived in the United States for the last 20 years. But her parents moved to Australia for 10 years and moved to America. And it was just more the fact that they were going to give it a go and, and know that there's a land of opportunity or whatever you want to call it. Um, but you're willing to back yourself and go out and give it a crack. Because if you can't do that, then who the hell are you going to ever back in your life? Um, so I think that's really, really powerful to, to, to start learning and flexing that muscle in your, in your mindset to go and say, yeah, I can do this. I don't know what the outcome is going to be, but I'm okay with that because it's going to be a challenge and it's getting comfortable being uncomfortable. And it's, and it's the uncertainty that every entrepreneur is going to have and, uh, right. and not everyone needs to be that way. So it, it, like there's, there's never a right or wrong uh, or there's like we always say here as well, there, there's never an absolute statement that that's true for everyone, right? So, um, but yeah. Anyway, so so you started thirty eight thousand dollars in a triplex um, in Syracuse, New York. Today, in Texas, you guys own two hundred and twenty plus more than two hundred million dollars in in real estate um, with um, with your investors. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm one of them, by the way. Mm-hmm. So um, we have all that, all that, all those properties. So. How, how did that happen, right? Like, it's great. So everyone says, okay, well, you know what? Like, listen, okay, awesome. You, t- you took a bus on your own, you went to Syracuse. That's it, right? We, we, we pack it up. We'll turn, we'll, turn the, we'll turn the podcast up. That's all you get to know. <laughs> yeah. um, so, um, so for, I guess, yeah, what specifically um, started to make sense after that first trip to Syracuse where you bought, well, not, I'm not sure if you bought it in the first no, trip. No, it wasn't, it wasn't the first trip. It was over a period yeah. of six months, every sort of weekend for every other weekend right. for a period of time to getting to right. know the market. Yeah, so the, the story goes and the, the venture goes that I I bought deal number one, which was at Triplex, and I got I, I was able to buy it all cash. I held it for a couple of months or I, I held it all cash for a couple of months and then I got a line of credit to from the from a local bank and I was able to buy deal number two. Still work in New York. I then partnered with someone to flip a house in Philadelphia, working really hard and trying to make sorry, things sorry, happen. Sorry, I'm going to interrupt you there. I'm sorry because that's a question that um, uh, we get a lot and, and, and you know I know I had it and it's, okay, how were you able to get a, a, a loan after that, like because you were working, because of your status, yeah. a lot of people, good, good especially question. Especially foreign investors, foreign investors, like they come here, and it's like, okay, 
get in a loan? How does that even work? Yes. And, and am I even able to get it? Like, you know? Well, that, well so, the, so the, the, the question, well, the, the path um, of least resistance was just buy the property, the initial property or cash because I, I, I'd yeah. saved up some money to, to you know, it was about $40,000 right. and I saved that up and that was what I was using as the cash to go out and do my first deal, right? And I hadn't even done a deal in right. Australia and I was going to use that cash. If I'd stayed in Australia, I was going to flip a house in Aussie or do something mm-hmm. with that money. Um, but then I, and, and again, I didn't, I wasn't giving it to me. It, I, I saved it myself. Um, but I then, you, it was, it was my money. It was my money to lose. It was my money. I was okay. And not saying that you go out and lose it, but you, but you have to have that chat with yourself to say, this may not work out. Right. And what, what's, and are right. you okay with that not working out? And I was, and so I was, and that's what investing is, right? Because you've got to go and invest and you're taking risk. So when I bought that property or cash, and then I developed a relationship with the local bank, it was called First Niagara Bank. I don't think it's around anymore. I think it was bought by mm-hmm. KeyBank. Um, but what I was able to do was build up a relationship over a short period of time, you know, three or four months with a local bank manager. And when, I, when my renters were depositing checks into my um, account, my LLC account that I had open there, he could right. see that the property was producing cash flow or producing cash. And thus, over a period of three or four months, I then went back to him and said, hey, look, I bought this thing 38000 bucks. I've got about another ten grand into it and from CapEx fee. You know, I just spruced it up a little bit. Can I get a line of credit? And he said, let me see what I can do. And he came back and he gave me, eventually gave me a line of credit for $25,000. And that was able to – and then through more saving of, of, for my, my job at that point because I'd been in the United States for about 12 months now, um, I was right. able to combine that. Um, th- that uh, that line of credit with the collateral of the first deal and buy deal number two for forty five thousand dollars, which was a duplex. So right. it was able from one to another just by by. And it, now you could go get a loan um, other ways. Other foreigners can go get loans. I just happened to pick the path of least resistance, which was just buy it all cash. But you could go get a hard money loan and right. refinance it. You could borrow money from friends and family like there's a whole other slew of ways of getting money yeah, maybe and maybe you're gonna have some different requirements exactly. in terms of uh well they're not gonna give you 80 percent ltv but maybe 50 exactly for, you know, exactly yeah, yeah. And that, that's exactly right as a foreigner when i first went down the road of, of looking for loans it was just like no sorry you, you don't have any credit so the only thing you're any option right. you really got is a hard money loan and at that stage i probably wasn't ready to do a hard money loan just because of my I wouldn't say lack of experience, but just lack of knowledge of, of just because I was so fresh to the United States, I didn't really want to get into bed with someone I didn't know, if that makes sense. So um, hard money loans were, were sort of a new thing for me, come, moving to the United States and learning about that. But it is a, definitely an option that you can do. Um, and I'm, you know, uh, I'm actually using one now to buy, buy a personal resident here in Los Angeles because of COVID-19, but that's a completely different story. Um, but yeah, so that's, there's, there are ways and means of getting it done. You just depending on what your own circumstances are. So yeah. I'd like to, you know, before getting deeper into, I know you want to talk a little bit more, Lee, about his, uh, you know, the properties, his, his, you know, his overall, how, how he got into large multifamily. But I wanted to talk a little bit more about the, the elephant in the room, this crisis we're living, you know, the financial crisis of 08 was a, a collapse of the financial system. That's where it all started with subprime mortgages and loss of mm-hmm. confidence in the financial system. In this case, is a little bit of the other direction, the source of the crisis is the virus, which is pretty much shutting down the economy. But there are a lot of investors out there uh, talking and speculating on how this crisis will impact the economy as a whole, and then specifically our industry real estate. So what are you seeing, Reed, uh, and what is your approach to preparing for the next 6, 12, 18 months? How are you planning to find good deals? How are you raising that discretionary equity? How will your investment strategy change or will it change at all? Talk, us to, talk, to, talk to us a little bit more about that. Well, yeah, so let's talk about the current situation, which is now April 21st. I don't know when this this podcast is going to go live, but when it does, we are still in the thick of it. We're still in our houses. So no one has a crystal ball. Um, the, the, all I can say for certain is the longer we're in our houses, the more it's going to hurt us as a real estate investors, as real estate owners, right? Because for the last month, the last, yeah, pretty much the last month, um, we have been tracking every single day and week uh, collections. You know, how is the rent? You know, because we sort of got in. I think the whole thing sort of really kicked off mid March. We then created um, flyers and emails to our tenants uh, across the 1,900 units that we own, saying, "Hey, look, we're going to do uh, a few things to help you out to try and help pay the month of April's rent." And this is pre, you know, stimulus checks. You know, things were still being created by the government. And thus, we've been tracking um, the collections over a period of time. If 
it's all well and good that those stimulus checks are coming, but they're coming very slowly. And thus, it means that people don't have money to um, to spend, right? The, the first thing is going to be on food. The second thing might be actually on healthcare. And the third thing actually then might be down the line is rent. So um, the people, a lot of people are scared, right? And the, 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 the longer we're in our houses, the, the more it's going to, the longer this recovery is going to take. Hopefully by coming early um, May, we're back into some normalcy. Um, but you ask, that, that's, that's the sort of the short term. What, you know, I think for overall, our April collections was above 90% across the 1900, sorry, above 95%, which was across the, um, the, the 1900 units, which is good. Uh, we do have some assets that are, you know, we have more of a risk. Like, you know, when we sent out that email originally, um, we had, you know, say 30 people reach back out to us and say, hey, I might have an issue paying April or might have an issue paying May. Um, and so the unknown of that is really causing a lot of uncertainty in people. And thus is giving the most, me the most uncomfortableness, if that's even a word, <laughs> uh, regarding how we, we, we come out of this. Because when we don't know the end date, and you're just sort of trickling along. When's the when's the stimulus checks coming? Am I gonna you know um, qualify for the PPP? You know, or there's just so much unknown. When there's unknown, you know, people are scared. And so, with a little bit more certainty in the market, hopefully it's coming in the next week or two where we do have okay, we're now going to be let out, and this is how we're going to restart the economy. When politicians and, and lawmakers are still discussing that. That, that that's that's not good for my renters, right? Because they're like they they're probably paycheck to paycheck, and they want to get back to work. Um, so I think you know we're it, it is we're in unprecedented times. We need clarity out of politicians and governments in order to people to 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 put some calm back into the economy in terms of just being able to leave our houses and go back to work. Once we do get back to work, I think the recovery will be slower because obviously the was it twenty two million people filed for joblessness. Like that's yep, massive. Yep. That's massive. That's crazy. And so some of those people are going to be some of my tenants, right? And so um, I think the getting back to there will be a rebound. I don't know if it's going to be immediate. I think it's going to be more of like a Nike swoosh. Like it's been a very steep, and then it's going to slowly come back up. Um, the big thing that I I think in in twelve months time we'll be back to some normalcy. I think the Q two will be very slow. Q three will start to see. Some some movement again, and Q4 and Q1 of 2021, we'll start to see trying to come back out of this thing. Hopefully, that's that's the quickest I can see it coming. For right now, from so that's from the deal point of view, from deal flow point of view, we've been underwriting deals pre-corona and we're offering pre-corona. We all those deals are now, you know, we've readjusted for equity expectations and we've readjusted for, you know, occupancy expectations. And a lot of those deals have now been taken off the table because we've either they just haven't got their number, you know. So go back three or four months ago, they wanted 40 million bucks and you know, whisper price is 40 million bucks. Well, now they're like, oh, we'll, we'll take 35. You know, there's there's already discounts starting to happen. But in saying that, the best mark deals, I'm not seeing a lot of deals right now, but the best deals were, are going to be had not now, but I think come Q3, Q1, oh, sorry, Q4, Q1 and into 2021. Because remember, back in 2008, the best deals weren't didn't happen in 2008, 2009. The best deals actually happened in 2010. Um, and and yeah. real estate moves slow. So I think you've got to be patient. Um, you've got to, we've got to weather the storm right now and try and whatever you can do to you know keep the assets moving forward, talk with banks. The only reprieve here, um, guys, is that this is worldwide. This is not like it's an American problem or it's not just an Australian problem. It is worldwide. And every te- every landlord across the globe has been want- yeah. is wanting rent uh, from their tenants and how we as investors collect that rent, um, we're all in the same boat. The interesting thing it's yeah. going to be is once we do get the green light to leave our houses, how each different MSA within the United States and where you are investing, how quickly do we get back to normalcy? Because we're all going to be at the starting box together. How quickly out of the gates do we do we all, you know, does Austin go compared to San Antonio, compared to New York, compared to, you know, Tampa, Florida? That is all going to be really, really, you know, influential in how we get back to some normalcy. Like when a sporting event's going to come back? When can we start going back to restaurants and bars and entertainment and, and all that? is consumers spending money and thus growing the GDP. So 
there's a lot of questions to be answered and a lot of uncertainty still back to my uncertainty you know point that we don't have clarity on and thus it's going to cause the bit of the slower recovery to occur when you have uncertainty because no one knows where the north star is that we're all trying to strive towards right now we're just trying to scramble to find a you know a vaccine <laughs> um, and trying to test people so that's that's my two cents on it. I think there will be opportunities come. It's just batten down the hatches right now. You know, make sure you're working with your lenders, with your you know property managers day every day to to, to make sure you are collecting rents. Um, and and from an investment point of view, if you are investing in deals, this is going to have an impact. Let's not beat around the bush. This will have an yeah. impact. This will probably ding your IRR. Now, the good thing about investing in real estate is that you're not going to lose your money at all. Like people have lost their skirt. Um, look at the oil industry right now. They, it's negative oil prices of <laughs> barrels of oil, which is ridiculous. Um, so being in real estate, particularly multifamily, I think we're in a very, very good space, even compared to say office or retail. Retail would be is up the, up the creek right now. Um, and yeah. even in some like self-storage, you know, I'm sure your self storage bill isn't going to be the first thing you're going to remember to pay um, when you're you're struggling to keep you know the rent paid or the food on the table. So, being in multifamily is, I my belief, one of the is the safest commercial asset to be in. Um, and but from an investment point of view, you probably would have seen some of your you know investors and operators like ourselves. We have paused um, distributions, we've paused capital expenditure. Um, and it will ultimately have an impact on your prob- cash flow for the year, first and foremost, but it probably will have an impact overall on the five-year you know, horizon. It might have a bit, you know, probably a ding your IRR, maybe 100 yeah. to 150 basis points. That's just, you know, pulling a number out of my, out of, out of left field. But in saying that, it is in five years time, we will look back at this and go, remember the COVID-19 stuff? <laughs> and then probably laugh about yeah. it. So, so yeah. yeah. No, I, uh, I agree. And then, you know, I guess that's a, that's a good segue to to actually go back to understand why uh, you decided to. You know, obviously we, we're not going to have enough time to listen to the whole story okay. uh, in, in detail. How you got to, <laughs> uh, yeah, which, which is fine. Uh, uh, you know, you have your podcast. I invite everyone to go listen to Reed's podcast. I'm sure you've told your oh, story there too many right? times, mate. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, but but I do want to talk about then. Okay, well, yeah. Why why multifamily then? Because you brought it up and uh, you 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 think it's one of the, the the asset classes that's gonna withstand any anything that comes out as you know in the, in the economy. Not not in, in, not in uh, as a whole. Obviously, it's gonna suffer. Right. But uh, but it's it's very strong and historically it has been right. So. So why that? Why why did you take that route, uh, and why did you decide to partner up and um, basically build a, an investment company strictly focused in uh, multifamily assets? Well, look. So the the first thing is the the, shel- the shelter, right? People, human needs is food and shelter, um, and that's what we need first and foremost. So um, coupled with the fact that we are having um, where we're in a country and and a lot of Western countries are moving to a more of a renting based system where they just the affordability is too high for them to um, buy houses. Now, given this COVID-19 check, uh, I don't know if that's going to change the the horizon, but but in general, we are in uh, we are a nation of renters. I, I wholeheartedly believe in a strong working class. That is hasn't been happening as much anymore, and thus the you know the the, the American dream of owning your own house is becoming a little bit harder and harder every single year. Yeah. This may have a good impact on trying to readjust that a little bit. The COVID nineteen, um, but in general, from a thirty thousand foot point of view, um, it is being it has been coming it has become harder and harder to own, um, and that's due to lack of wage growth uh, in and around the, the working class. Um, sectors, and you know, if and I rent to I, I rent to working class people. So um, you know, when we have strong wage growth, you have strong rent growth. When you have strong rent growth, you have people who want to go out and buy houses. Like the the, the properties we own, we have people not renewing their their leases because they're going out and buying houses. We want to be at that sort of last stop before you go out and buy a house. Um, so we believe that that's a really good space to be in because we people are always going to need a roof over their head until they want another roof over their head, and that's when they're going to go out and buy a house. Um, so right. then it comes back to the affordability and wages and all that sort of good stuff. So 
Um, in my opinion, uh, the, 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 the shrinking middle class is not necessarily a good thing for multifamily, but I do think overall multifamily is a, it will be here for the long term. The way in which we live our lives, uh, the way in which we have urban um, growth in terms of wanting to be close to where we work and close to where we eat and entertain and all that sort of stuff. Um, and being at the upper end of that sort of class B plus A minus um, not being in that C or, or, or D neighborhood anymore. Um, being in the path of progress is really important um, because people are always going to want to want to uh, rent from you. And when you have high demand, in a, and the other thing is jobs, right? So when you do have a lot of jobs in a market, um, jobs drive um, you know demand, right? So when there's low, there's a high demand and low supply, meaning that when new product, new multifamily product is coming to market, if there's a high barrier to entry, like there is in Austin, Texas, or you know, LA, or um, the fact that you've got to build something from scratch, then buying existing yeah. assets um, to support that demand, you're going to be okay over the long term. And when I say long term, I'm talking five to 10 years. Um, so overall, I, my, my thesis is that when you're buying in a, in a market which has high jobs, a good, a good job growth, good job wage growth, um, and supporting that sort of middle class to first home owner type, um, you're going to be in an okay position over the long term because you, people are always going to want to rent from you. They're always going to need a, a roof over their head and that's going to help you in the, in the long term. Yeah. So it's not only the, the, the amount of jobs, but the quality the of the jobs. The quality of the jobs. Right? Like, yep, that's correct. And, and the growth, right? You have to have the you have to have wage growth. If you don't have that, you're never going to be able to just keep going rent. You know, the rental growth is just not going to happen. So right, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that makes uh that makes a lot of sense. Um obviously uh you don't have to sell me on multifamily, <laughs> but um so yeah, man, I mean, listen. I think uh, I think another another topic, uh, another thing that I wanted to, I guess, talk about a little bit is the it's it's more about the mindset that, uh, and this is definitely a personal question because for everyone it's going to be a little bit different, but um, so, but what's what's your goal? Like, what's the end goal for you? Because uh, we one of the things that we talk. Um, not 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 only that we talk about on the podcast, but it's like our the way we're building this this uh, educational company. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's based on understanding that okay, everyone has a dream. That it's a little bit different for everyone, but at the end of the day, it's about okay. Well, for the majority of people, anyway, is to be able to not have to work, right? Or Cho change choose your, to work. Yeah. <laughs> or, yeah. Exactly. Trade your time for money, but instead that you have some money coming in that allows you to work or not work or do whatever you want with your life, you know, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. basically stay at home or travel, whatever it is. Um, so that's kind of the angle for, for the majority of people. Uh, and um, But there's like three stages, right? Like you need to build a foundation. You need to understand basic uh, financial um you know, it's an economy and, and the, the, the basics of investments and all that. So you need to study and you need to educate yourself on those basic stuff. But then you need to choose a vehicle to grow your capital or make or create more, 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 more of that investment capital. Meaning you need to trade your time for money, whether that's a W-2 job or you, you're an entrepreneur, you build a company. In your case, uh, you started this private equity firm. But then the third, um, the third firm, I'm sorry, the third step is to take that capital that you're, you're bringing in from your job and uh, invest it passively, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Which is part of uh, basically what you provide the opportunity to investors to do. Uh, but for you, how does it? How does it? How does it look? Yeah, that's a. It's. A, I loved how you broke it down there into that foundation piece because I think I'll give you a little bit of you know just some insight into my mind a little bit. So the for the last ten years, you know, which has been since I picked up the book, book Rich Dad Poor Dad, mm -hmm. the North Star, and up until two thousand and seventeen, was financial freedom. Be your own boss. Financial freedom. Be your own boss. Financial freedom. Like you might say, with the word financial freedom, is this means you don't need to work for someone else in order to keep food on the table. You, you might not be, you got to still work because I, I still work. I, I, I run a yeah. investment company, um, but I get yeah. to choose that I'm now my own boss. So I think that's what, when people talk about financial freedom, there's obviously the ultimate financial freedom. You never have to freaking lift a finger in your life, but 
I, I'm a guy that I'll, I'll never sit on a beach and do nothing. Uh, I'll always be doing right. something. So right. for the longest period right. of time, it, the North Star was that financial freedom, being your own boss. I finally achieved it in the middle of 2017 when I married my wife and I got to get a green card. Um, I I could have done it a little bit sooner, but with the visa stuff, it just wasn't. It didn't make sense. Plus, I was already working for a, a ground up developer here in LA, which was producing me a lot of awesome experience. Now, as yeah. as as a CEO, business owner, entrepreneur, what is my new north star? And it's been a little bit of a you know because you've just been so grinding for so freaking long that you're mm. just like, wow, I've got this extra 40 hours in my week or 50 hours that I don't have to spend at a W-2, which is awesome. Um, but now what's the new the North Star? So it's, it's looking within and, and I definitely, as a, as a human being, um, I, I think at the beginning of the show, I, I, I alluded to uncertainty and, and I like uncertainty. Um, but, but understanding what that uncertainty is, Lennon, I had no idea when I first moved to this country that I would be sitting here talking to you about 1,900 units and all the good stuff. Um, yeah, and and, and, and the, the biggest thing that I can say is that for me, you can overestimate what you can achieve in a year, but you can underestimate what you can achieve in a decade. And the last freaking yeah. decade has been bloody awesome. The next decade is sort of don't worry about what's going to happen when I'm 43. Just enjoy now, right? Open as many doors as you can now and just walk through those doors like I did when I got on the plane back from, you know, to New York back in the day. I didn't know it was on the other side of the door. I had no idea I'd be talking to you right now 10 years later. So it sort of it, it solidifies the fact that I can back myself. I'm going to enjoy my life. I've had some personal loss in my life recently that it's come to make me focus more on enjoying the moment rather than always constantly shooting for where do I need to be when I'm 50 or where do I need to be when I'm 45 or blah, 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 blah. It's good to have targets, um, but it's also good just to freaking enjoy the journey because we're not we're not here forever. Um, and, and so I don't know if that really answers your question, but I'm also in the development phase of my own company. And, I, and, and for the, ne- the next foreseeable, foreseeable future, next call it till I'm 40, I'll be doing I'll yeah. be doing this, doing deals. I'll be doing real estate for the rest of my life. Whether I'm actively as a CEO and doing what I'm currently doing, no, I probably won't right. be doing that. But you know, by the time I come 40, do I want to move back to Australia? Do I want to start investing in Australia? I think I do. Um, you know, but but right now I'm really enjoying growing Wildhorn Capital. We want to double the portfolio in the next three to five years. Um, uh, we we also have a joke that if we ever you know we want we very much a life lifestyle by life by design sort of company. We we. Yeah. You know, Andrew's in Florida right now. He's been there for the last month with his family and we're still, you know, as long as we've got internet, we can work. Um, so really yeah. being conscious of how we grow, we're being sustainable growth. We don't want to go and be 20,000 units. You know, I think we'll, we'll probably max out at 5,000. We're, we're currently at two. So, we're, you know, we're not, we're looking at like doing a deal a quarter. You know, you get to a point where you've got yeah. 15, maybe 12 to 15 assets in your portfolio. You're buying four deals a year. You're selling four deals a year. That's, that's yeah. sustainable. Um, and you know yeah. we'll have a couple of employees and have a really freaking good life as well. So we've always joked that if we ever got to the point that we need HR, human resources, we're done growing. So um, oh, yeah. I don't know if that really answers the question, but it's sort of just the, it, I enjoy travel. I am also yeah. enjoying you know focusing on other pillars in my life as well. Like the business pillar is so important, and and in in the past I've probably prioritized that business pillar above health or above family, but making sure that those other pillars in your life, you know, family, health, love, f- having fun are also well, you, you're well supported because like any, you know, like look at a table, a table has four legs. If you're just leaning on one leg, i.e. the business and it falls away, then the only place you're going to go is down. So having other things in your life that 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 def- define you and fulfill you on other levels is really important as well. Um, and sort of a little bit of that shift in the last three to four years as I've come out of working for someone else and now working for myself is really f- – and that helps me be a better leader. It helps me be a better CEO and it helps me be a better investor. So, um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but it's a little bit of insight of how, how I'm thinking. No, it, it, it does because actually, yeah, that's that, that's, that was a better answer uh- – than, than, than the question <laughs> because actually it uh, yeah it's, it's exactly what I was looking for to understand how, how are you thinking about uh, your your future your career your investing um, you get a, you know get a little bit of insight into your mind uh, and by the way the way you're thinking uh, reminds me of a book um, one of the one of my favorite books I read uh, last year it's called the surrender experience okay. the, the, read it. The surrender experience Experiment, sorry, the surrender experiment uh, by Michael Singer. So just I'll check, it out. check it out. Uh, that sounds like a good one. Okay. Yeah, this, this, this guy is basically this 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 economics um, professor, I think it was, 
that uh, ended up opening a, a yoga retreat thing in, in Gainesville, Florida. And it's, it's a real story, by the way. And, and then goes from there. He ends up taking a, a, a company public and it's, it's just crazy. So, um, but it's nice because it's, it's, it's about, okay, basically letting yourself uh, say yes to a lot of different mm-hmm. things when you're at the point where, okay, you're okay. You feel like you have your, like your, your spiritual life, you're fine. Financially, you're, you're, you're fine. Your family, the whole thing. Then you're in a position where you're able to say yes to a lot of different things yeah. that will take you different paths. And, and, and I also think it's, it's the, you know, the being more, you know, I, I work with a business coach and, and she's actually more of a lifestyle, but sorry, a life coach, but knowing that I've been cruising at this altitude for the last call it two years or 18 months, how do I take it up yeah. a notch? And that not just in the business, but also in my life, you know, how do I be more? How do I give back more? How do I do more? Um, and it's not, it's not the doing more like, you know, traveling and, you know, Ferrari, like I don't, I'm not, I'm not that type of guy, Ferraris or anything like that, like, like crap, but more just right. the giving back and being that a better leader and a better husband and a better son and, you know, potentially a better father in, in years to come. But like all those type of things are really important to me. And um, I think it's, it's, it's also come from a point of uh, understanding who I am uh, and being comfortable in the skin that I'm in and then, and, and, and walking my own walk, I think is, is really, really important. So, so yeah. Yeah, I love it. Great. To someone out there that wants to get into commercial multifamily real estate, uh, maybe tackle their first 40, 60, 80, even 100 units, what would be some applicable tip, pieces of advice for them? For okay. Okay. Okay, let's 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 get this into the number one piece of advice that you if you're looking to break into this game and I was resistant to it for many years when I first moved to the United States and I was pitched by every man to Kathmandu and back Kathmandu and back I should say um, you got to get a mentor you got to be sur- you, you one got to get a mentor you two got to surround yourself with people who you aspire to be and three you got to be educated. Um, so the mentor can have sort of help with that education, but but going out and changing who you surround yourself with. But the mentor is super important because the act of, and I remember when I got my first mentor, the act of just parting way with a large chunk of money at that at that period in my life, and it doesn't, and, and it was two and a half grand. It wasn't that large, but it also is large depending on where you are in your life. Um, it, it it reinforced that theory, that thing that I was saying before. I'm taking a bet on myself. And I'm backing myself and I'm willing to part way with this money in order to go off and to make my career better. And so getting involved in a 30, 40, 50, 60, 100 unit, 200 unit deal, you have to go and get a mentor that is already doing it. You can ride on their coattails and you can learn from them. You also need a mentor that you you like and you can you can trust. You don't have to have a guru that you know is out on stage and doing everything. You might find someone who's willing to do it for you who is um, who isn't doesn't have a massive name, but you resonate with them. Well, go and see if they want to be your mentor. The other thing is obviously surround yourself with five people you aspire to be. Go if you're not if you're the smartest person in the room, go change the room you're standing in. Uh, and that's the con- you know you got to go do that all the time and and change um, the way in which you're thinking because that will help you. But you're the average of the five people you, you surround yourself with, so you'll change the way you think. And then the education piece is that you've got to continue to learn. And I don't care how good you are. And I will continue to always learn throughout my life. If you stop learning, you stop growing. And it's a little bit of cliche, but pick up books, read them, be inquisitive, be curious, and just always want to, always want to know more, you know, like ask good questions or there's no such thing as a dumb question. So continuing to be curious is is also really important as well. That brings me to to another question, actually, because I'm a true believer in mentorship. I love that you touched that point and commit a lot of time, a lot of money to working with mentors. And for me, the power of consuming that knowledge, the skills, the, the experience from someone that has done it, you know, done what you want to achieve at the, you know, the, at, at high levels is so powerful to me. So could you talk a little bit more on, you know, what, what are for those people out there trying to find that mentor or mentors, what would be some type of, uh, of advice to finding one? In, in, in- well, I think first and foremost, you've got to resonate. Like um, when, I, when I first started looking for mentors, I, I, I put it off for so long. I said, I can do this by myself. And, and, I, and I, you know, I did. I got a couple of little properties in, up in Syracuse. I didn't actually get a mentor until after I'd done my third deal. Um, but that, that was a small multifamily, that is. But to really take my investing career to the next level, I needed to get a coach. Um, you know, like, you know, look at look at all the big sports stars around the world. They all have coaches. 
But to choose the right coach at that time in my life, I didn't really want to go spend 20, 30, 40,000 bucks on a mentorship. Uh, and that's what I was getting pitched. I went and found someone who'd only done one deal. Um, he was a little bit older. Than, I think he's you know four or five years older than I am, and he was reasonably priced, <laughs> and that was that ticked all the boxes for me, you know. And that was just it allowed myself to give me permission to go and say, okay, I can afford this one. I don't have any, you know. There's no excuses, right? You know, sometimes you're like, oh, it's twenty thousand dollars. I can't afford it. And that's an excuse. I'm not going to do it. Well, I I made sure I didn't have any excuses, so I couldn't say no, and I could only say yes, and that would then take me to the next level. So you got to resonate with the person. They've got to be actively doing deals so you can do deals and you can learn from them. And you got to, you know, if, 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 if cost is an issue, then go to someone who you can afford. And, and that, you know, hopefully that will give you a bit more hands-on attention because they're not as big as some of the big gurus out there offering mentorship um, for, you know, a, a squillion dollars. <laughs> so, yeah. But it definitely helps. It definitely helps. Yeah. Um, well, man, I mean, listen, I think, uh, I think it's time to, to wrap it up, but, uh, this has been, this has been amazing. Uh, that is just, I, I knew it was going to be an amazing interview. Uh, I appreciate you taking the time, um, to, you know, share with us your, your story. And, um, I, I think we definitely need to repeat, um, this, you know, do another interview with you to get into the, need a greedy of um, managing uh, all these multifamily sure. units and understanding the acquisitions part of it, the asset management, relationship building, all that good stuff, operations, et cetera, which uh, I know you're, you're, you you know, you definitely excel at. So um, just, you know, Arturo, I don't know if you have any, any, any parting questions before Reed uh, shares his yeah, contact I information. I would love to, to wrap it off, uh, you know, with, with, with this question. Uh, Reed, let's imagine that, you know, God forbid you have five days left on earth uh, and everything you've done, you said, you've written uh, these podcasts, you got to take with you. You, mm -hmm. you know, no one will ever be able to know about you or what you did, uh, but you have the opportunity to write down uh, two to three things or as many as you want that you consider yourself to, to be true. Two to three things that you've learned to have driven your life that you can leave behind to your kids, to your friends, family. What would those be? But, that's by a, the good, way, that's a very good question. And I always like to clarify when, when we ask these questions, we, we, we quote unquote steal these questions from other um, podcasts and, and, and other people that are, you know, are doing podcasts. So this one specifically is from, from Lewis House, uh, from from LA, the the School of Greatness podcast. He always asks these questions, and we just love uh, how it's formulated. Okay. So, well, yeah, uh, thanks, Lewis. Uh, so, I think so. Let's just. I think I can break it into three. Um, from a let's call it the business world and whatever um, right. the piece of advice that I always, my dad always used to tell me when I was growing up was a fool and their money are easily parted. So don't be a fool, you know, and go out and be educated. Um, I think the the backing yourself, like, you know, the world's your oyster. You can go out and literally do anything you want in your life. And it and, and people say, you know, you can't, and not everyone starts at not everyone starts at zero, and I get that. Um, but it is comes down to mindset and it in, it does come down to being curious and learning to back yourself. So so just being curious and backing yourself and know that the world is your oyster. And I think the, the the last one that I'd write down is is bloody have some fun along the way, you know, because you only you only do live once, and and if you if my life was to be cut short in five days' time, I would make sure that everyone know knows that I had a freaking awesome time uh, in my life, and and so should you. So, so yeah, yeah, I love it, man, love it, good stuff. Um, all right, so we need we need to let you go, man. Uh, I know you 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 have you know you're a busy guy. You need to get going. So um, why don't you share um, with our audience where they can reach out to you, learn more about you, uh, invest with you. Sure. Uh, feel free to plug away any anything you want. Yeah, look, the quickest and easiest way to get in contact with me is go to reedgoosens.com. That's R-E-E-D-G-O-O-S-S-E-N-S.com. You, there's plenty of links on there. You can see my books. You can see my podcast. You can click on links to say invest with me or learn from me, whatever you want to do. Um, and then for any of your listeners who are coming through LA, uh, when the when we do get let out of our houses, if you are ever coming through LA and you want to meet up for a beer or a coffee, um, just shoot me an email. Give me a few weeks heads up. But um, I'm always willing to, to meet up for 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 chat, uh, just talk shop. Um, just hit me up at info. That's I-N-F-O at reedgoosens.com and uh, we can make something happen. 
Sounds great. Awesome. Love it. Well, guys, uh, there you have it. Feel free to, of course, go ahead and comment and, and, and like this this episode on LinkedIn. You, um, not LinkedIn. Well, yeah, wherever you're you're seeing this um, this interview uh, or listening to this interview, uh, leave us a review. Leave us a comment. We'd like to know what you what you're thinking. Share it with your friends, and um, you know, just follow us on on all the social media platforms. We're Seabla Real Estate. Uh, en Twitter somos eh, Se Habla RE y, y bueno, ahí lo tienen Arturo, Reed, thank you guys this has been wonderful I'll see you guys on the next one Thank you Reed, thanks guys